This is Seven Thunders, your Rasta brother. And I'm about to tell you a story. This is story time with Seven Thunders. About the time I got lost in Jamaican cockpit country. A harrowing experience, I assure you. So this is the first time I was in Jamaica. It was one brother who was getting married. I won't go into detail, because the marriage didn't work, you know, and I knew it wasn't gonna work, but I wanted to go to Jamaica anyway. So he selected me to be his best man in his wedding in Kingston. That's how I got to Jamaica the first time. So I said, okay, I had enough money then. I had some successful projects that said I'm gonna go to Jamaica. So, because I don't really believe in church weddings as a roster, but I went anyway. So when I get to Jamaica, we went to the wedding and stuff with the roughneck preacher screw facing me and me screw facing him. You know, at the wedding, he giving me dirty looks, I'm giving him dirty looks back. You know, and then, like, what's this rock to do in my church? And I'm like, what am I doing in the church? You know what I'm saying? So then finally I got through that, and then we're driving, right? And I'm in the back seat, all up in the back seat, and they in the front seat, and they're on the way to the honeymoon place, but they already been together, but they just want to do it legal, because they're about to have a you, little Kaiunda. Excellent young graduate, you know. So, this is giving away a few things. <laughs> but, um, so, as we're driving, I'm seeing all kind of places I want to stop in Jamaica. Stands with rosters, people holding up big buds, you know, all kind of fruit stands, lagoons, you know, pretty turquoisey blue lagoons. I wanted to stop and go swimming because I snorkel and swim. They kept driving. You know, I'm like, stop right here, hold her. No, we gotta go to some place really nice, just wait. And I'm like, wait, this is really nice. And they're like, no, let's keep driving. I'm like, I'm school facing, you know, one o'clock, you know. So we keep driving. And finally, we drive all the way to Mopay, passing this place, this place, Rasta's waving us down, them not stopping. So, as they say in Jamaica, I was getting well vexed in the back seat there, right? So, finally, we get to the resort. And when we get there, it's a villa up in the hills of Mopay. It's nice, you know, white villa, got a swimming pool, hot tub. They had a maid, a cook, and all of that, a whole staff there. Not my kind of vacation whatsoever, right? And so, I had a place there, their children had a place there, some of their friends there was gonna have like a party there and whatnot. But I wanted to see Jamaica. So I expressed that I wanted to see Jamaica. I don't want to be scooped up in a villa. I want to be out in the countryside. And they could have a honeymoon, kind of, but they was already together. So. They said, for a wedding present, they was gonna give me the rental car, and I just have to turn it in to the airport in two days. So I was like, excellent, because I want to get back to all them places that I saw and see Jamaica. So I took off outside of the villa. I saw one brethren selling some lamb's bread, ganja. It was some big, long, brown buds. So I bought an ounce for $20. $20 US ganja is really inexpensive down there. So I rode me one good Bob Marley and smoked it. And then I took off again. Then I got real sleepy. I drink coffee now when I smoke. I got real sleepy around Kingston because it's getting late. No, around the grill. So I pulled into a beach way at West End Road because it's too late to get a hotel. It would be inexpensive. I just kicked open the back door of the rental car and went to sleep on the back seat with my pillow and bag and whatnot. I mean, my, my duffel bag as a pillow and some towels. It was really hot. And so I woke up and I was hungry. I went for the swim in the ocean and I was driving down West End Road in the grill. Now this is how I got lost in cockpit country. Now, hold on. And I saw this one cook shop called Java's Ita Shop. Ita means natural in Jamaica, which means it's vegetarian food, no pork or unclean food, and it's kosher, halal. I taught to roster, so I put in there, there's one excellent elder roster named Joppa that cooked vegetarian food. He had a nice yard in the grill, and when I put up to the shop, he had psilocybin mushrooms on the counter, Blue Street, 
facing the road. And he had really good herb, he had really good food. And so I had a Jamaican breakfast there. Kalaloo, Aki, um, dumplings, and some orange juice. Yeah. And then he was asking me if the rental car was my vehicle. I said, no, mine is a, it's a, it's a rental vehicle. But you control it, he said. I said, yeah. Then it's your vehicle, mine. And he was walking around the vehicle. This is a long time ago, you know, when people didn't normally drive cars so much, Rasta. <coughs> so he was real proud that I had a vehicle and he wanted to go for a ride with me. But he was saying he had a big order for Aki patties and Kalalu patties for a party, which is a rolled up vegetable dish in Jamaica that a lot of people like a lot. So he couldn't go, so he's gonna send his DJ, Raphael, to show me up into the hills of Jamaica. And this is also how I found my property, where I have in Jamaica. So he gave Raphael the, D, the day off. I smoked some herbs in there with him, and he was playing excellent music, really excellent reggae music. And it was really good vibes there. So Raphael took me north to Lucy up in the hills. And up in the hills, I met a brother named Curly Locks. We had to walk up a trail and then down a trail, way off road. He had a gate uh, up in the hills about five miles north of the ocean. And he had a wife from Germany. He was a really good brother. And he had a four acre property with fruit trees, coconut trees, uh, mango trees, flowers planted all over it. He was an artist. And I visited with him and got some herb, he made honey. I got some Jamaican honey that was dark and rich, tastes like flowers. And me and him reasoned together, we could finish each other's sentence. He is a really good Rasta. And I didn't feel like leaving, but it's getting dark and I wanted to see the rest of the Jamaica. So he told me next time I come to Jamaica, not to stay at a hotel, to come stay with him up in the hills. And so when I left there, it was getting dark and I wanted to get over to the east of Jamaica near the Blue Mountains again, cause I liked that region. So I took off driving and then I came to a fork in the road that didn't have a sign. You could either go left or right. And I went left and that was wrong. Mm -hmm. I ended up lost up in cockpit country. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, it's before that. Before I went left, I got real tired. It was getting late at night, it was about 12 o'clock when I came out in the grill and dropped Raphael back in the grill and took off again. It was late. And so I was getting tired, so I, I was way up in the hills near Mondeville there. And I pulled off the road near a construction site where it was gravel built up and road piles. And I went to sleep in the car. And then about 15 minutes or so later, someone woke me up banging on the window. And it was a motorcycle police. And he said, open up in there, man. You on drugs or something? Open up the window. And I said, no, I'm not on drugs. I just got sleepy and I almost ran this old man over. And that's what just had happened. I was dozing off at the wheel. There's an old man with some goats walking in the middle of the road. And I came around the corner and I saw an old man's eyes get really big. And he went one way and this way and dove out the way and I almost hit the back foot of one of his goats because it was all up in the road. And I said, I could kill somebody, I gotta go to sleep. So I pulled off and went to sleep on the side of the road because I was way up in the hill, away from town. And I could see way down to town. And I didn't think it, nobody would see me. But the police could see my lights from way on the lower road. So he wanted to know who was up there. And he rode up there to see who I was, knocked on the window. And I opened the window, and then he heard my aunt accent. And then he said, oh, you from, from foreign? And I told him, yeah, from the States. And he said, I couldn't, I told him what had happened. I was falling asleep at the wheel. And he said, you can't just sleep on the side of the road in Jamaica. This is Patois, you know, that's how he talked. He said, Tifa man come and cut your throat and take everything. I said, cut my throat and take it. He said, yeah, man, he come and cut your throat and take everything. And he said, this is what you do, follow me. He said, he said uh, follow me to a club that's open, that if you pay the, the entry fee, 
the security guard will watch over you and you can sleep in the parking lot in your vehicle and nobody will trouble you. So he got on his motorcycle, he told me his name was Rainbow and that he really was an undercover roster, but he working as a police just to make a living and had to trim his locks. And so he said Harley was a roster. And so he got on his motorcycle and he drove, he got in front of me and escorted me into Mandeville to a reggae club. When I got to the reggae club, I paid the entry fee and I looked at the people going in, they were really dressed up. Yeah, they were really dressed up and I had on blue jeans and a, like a blue jean vest. And I didn't feel like I was dressed, they was like wearing suit clothes and stuff, that kind of older reggae crowd, you know? So I said, I'm just gonna get some rest. So I slept for about two hours. I woke up and I took off again. And when I took off again, it was real late at night. And I came to the Y in the road and it didn't have a sign. And I went the wrong way. I ended up up in cockpit country. Now cockpit country is up and down hills like this. And the bottom is misty and foggy and water and swamps and, and ponds. Up at the top, you can see over the clouds for long distances. They have towns in there called Akampong, Quickstep, Jericho, Nanny Town. And this is where the Maroons, the escaped slaves, with their leader, a warrior queen named Nanny, set up their communities. She was misty, like Harriet Tubman, like Sojourner Truth. And she led ex-slaves and she fought for them. She killed British soldiers. She took their horses from them. She was reported to repel bullets. She turned around and mooned some British troops once, they said, and they were shooting her in the butt and the bullets was ricocheting off her butt and none of them would go in. They said she had brought obia or black arts magic from Africa. And so she was kind of like a witch and she had powers. And she used the powers to overcome the slave hunters who hunted for Maroons, which means escaped slaves. The Maroons never were defeated. So, cockpit country was set aside for Maroons to this day and is a separate nation, sovereign from Jamaica, with its own rules. So that's where I got lost. And I went up and down, up and down. And cockpit country is also called the land of look behind because so many British soldiers and slavers got killed going in there to try to catch slaves they never returned, that they started riding with two soldiers on one horse, one looking forward and one looking behind for the ambush. So they called it the land of looking behind because Nanny and Kojo, two maroon leaders, used ambush and guerrilla fighting to overcome their captors. So that's where I was. And I was going up and down, coming through towns caught Ahom Pong quick step at three and four in the morning. And then I had lights on. And, and I was getting sleepy again and the police said not to sleep on the side of the road. So I ate some mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms because they can keep you awake. I once drove 51 hours cross country eating mushrooms, getting a guitar pair of Jali by to a band and a gig on the west coast, 51 hours straight from Michigan all the way to Oregon. But I was lost in cockpit country. I was eating mushrooms and it felt like something was in the back seat with me. Like something there riding with me. And as I went through, I kept looking in the rear view mirrors creeping me out. And as I was riding up and down through fog and mist where you couldn't see all in front of you like a few feet, I would come through little towns where my little dirt road <coughs> went between two houses or a few houses where you could almost touch the house out the window. They didn't have electricity out there. So my lights were shining through their house, waking them up. And I felt terrible, I was disturbing people at three in the morning and they didn't see vehicles up there that much. I saw vehicles up on blocks. They looked like 30 years old without wheels. Um, people didn't have electricity, they had candle lanterns, coffee lanterns, coffee cans with holes cut in it with candles in it. They was pretty that they held up. They had bottle torches. And I was waking people up and there's light and lanterns. And I had a Bob Marley tour jacket on. It was silky, 
shiny, red, gold, and green. And this man said, it's Bob, it's Bob Marley. <laughs> Cause he saw me and my locks was at the age then that kind of looked like him. I was like 30 years younger then. And he said, it's Bob, it's Bob, come see. And people would come and they say it was Bob too. And I started laughing. I was worried about waking him up. And then I circled around, I got lost and I come back to the same town. <laughs> Here I come back to Jericho, quick step. Making the same people going in circles. And he said, Here, come on, man, come see, it's Bob, it's Bob. And I'd be laughing. <laughs> so finally, I drove to the Sud Cave. I got on a road that led down. I ended up by a river called Wise River. And I found out it was Wise River because in the morning I was washing up in the river. I was looking at my map on the hood and smoking a spliff by the river, trying to figure out where I was. And I saw a man on a donkey on the side of the river on this little dirt trail that went up and down the river. And he was riding real fast, and he was way too big for the donkey. He was a big man, and his feet was out to the side. Mm -mm. And he was jiggling up and down on the donkey, like, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. and I thought I was in trouble, like I was on some man's property, because I pulled off the road down by the river to sleep and take a nap when it got daytime and wash up. And so when I seen him coming, I was kind of worried. Then I saw a big smile on his face, ear to ear. And he saw my red, gold, and green Bob Marley tour jacket from a distance. And he jumped off the donkey when he got to me. And he said, my name is Jeremiah. And put his hand out to shake hands with me. I told him what my name was. And he said, you got some ganja? And I had way too much urge. And I had to turn the vehicle in at the airport that day. And he, I gave him all the herb I had, which was about three ounces or something, a big pile of it. And I kept a little bit for me, and he was real happy at that. And I asked him where I was. He said, at the Wise River. And I thought he meant wise, like a wise person. But he meant Y apostrophe S, like where the river going to a wise, wise river. And he showed me how to get to the airport to follow this road north and it'd take you to the main highway north and go to Mobay. And so I left from there and I went north on that road. It was really pretty. It was rich farm country, rolling hills. Children were going to school. And when people in Jamaica, they hitch rides with people. They got private taxis, so they put their hand up if they need a ride. So I was giving youth rides to school, asking them about the area. And so they was telling me about their school, the kind of crops they grow, the weather, all that kind of stuff, their favorite music. They were really personable, good-natured, intelligent um, youth. And so I met a lot of people, people going to work on that road, giving them rides. And then when I got to Mobe, I washed the car and flew out of Jamaica. So the only property I saw was Curly Lock's property. And he told me when I get back to Jamaica to come see him because I got lost in cockpit country all night. And so I left, went back to the States. I worked for five years, saved up money. I came back to Jamaica and I was looking for property for two months with a crew that I was paying for to help me build the property up and whatnot, friends of mine and we're staying in the grill, and one of them met a German sister in a club at night who knew another German sister who was selling property in the hills. So we arranged a meeting. When I met her, she looked familiar, and I asked if she was Curly Locks' wife, because she looks like Curly Locks. And she said, yeah. And then I remembered she was Curly Locks' wife, and she said he passed on. He used to smoke ganja mixed with tobacco. And if you mix ganja with tobacco, the oils and the herb holds the tar and the nicotine in your lungs for way more than if you just smoke tobacco. And you can get cancer because it makes it stick like a glue. The resins and the herb, you shouldn't smoke them together. So he did that and he died quite young, like when he was about 50. And he left a widow, a German widow and his son, time. And so they couldn't live way up in the hills. It was too rough for them. She wanted to move back to Germany. So I bought the property 
from them. And it was a really good price. And I paid them extra because it was too good of a price. And that's how I come to get my property. So my property came to me mystically. Of all the properties that I could have got, the one that came to me is the one I visited and Curly Locks, the roster owner, said I should stay there the next time I come to Jamaica. So that's the property where the Higher Heights Exodus project is. So this is the story of Seven Thunders getting lost in cockpit country. <laughs>